Hi all. Um, lovely to be here today. My name's Leanne Atkin. I'm a doctor, but doctor by PhD. Um, I am a background of nursing, and I'm a vascular nurse consultant at Mid York's NHS Trust, and also a lecturer at the University of Huddersfield. And I've come here to speak with you today about exploring the best practice statement for the management of venous leg ulcers in a way to try to improve your patient outcomes, but also embracing some ability to be, enable your patients to be able to self-care. So this is what we're going to cover today, really. I'm going to introduce you some of the background in terms of venous leg ulcers and why we are here today. We're going to talk a little bit about the best practice statement. I'm going to really hopefully challenge you on your views of self-care and what this means in your hands and talk to you about some enablers to get some self-care involved in your current caseload. Um, I give no apologies for doing this little plug for Legs Matters. Um, I'm the chair of this campaign. Many of you may have seen Legs Matters and heard of us. If not, please visit our website. We are a number of coalitions that's come together with one voice. One voice to really try to raise patient and public awareness of leg conditions because at this moment in time the difficulty is is that patients are presenting too late to us and patients aren't able to recognize what good care looks like and our public facing campaign is about trying to change that so I've told you quite a bit about me what I'd like to know is a little bit about you if that's all right just to get a, a, a feel of the audience um, I'd like you, with your little voting pads that you can see on the chairs, if you, are, if you can see a voting pad on a chair that's not being used, can we send them backwards, if that's all right? Because we haven't got enough to go all the way down the back of the room. So if we keep following them backwards, hopefully, then you'll all get a voting pad. So what I'd like you to do is to just use that voting pad, point it to the air, and tell me whereabouts you are. What are you currently doing? So my computer just does a little bit of magic and then we'll see the results. Fantastic. So a large proportion of you, 37% of you, are actually from a community background. Um, with a scattering of, of nurses from a 24-hour home environment. Um, we've got some student nurses, fantastic to have some student nurses here. Oh, a couple of podiatrists, I always like a podiatrist, and a few others, which is very interesting as an other. Hopefully then, looking at where you're based, some of this is going to resonate with your current practice. So let's just start at the very beginning, shall we? Back in 2015, Julian Guest and Kath and Peter Vowden produced this now seminal piece of publication that talked about the burden of wound care across the UK. And this paper really did some important things because it articulated that there's currently 730,000 patients across the UK with an active lower leg wound. That equates to 1.5% of the adult population that we're serving. But unfortunately, in this paper, if you think about quality matrix and quality indicators, this paper told us that only 16% of patients were getting an ankle brachial pressure index. If any of you know anything about leg ulceration, an ABPI is the key to the door of compression. And if 84% of patients weren't accessing that key to the door, how can that be right? And this paper also articulated that there's a huge issue in terms of recurrence. It documented that 60, up to 69% of leg ulcers reoccur within 12 months. If 70% of wounds are reoccurring within only 12 months, you can sort of argue, what's the point of healing them in the first place? Because they're only likely to reoccur. And when you put all of that together, you think to yourself, the NHS needs a solution to all of this because that just simply isn't right. And I think the reason why I'm here and I think why you're here is that I think we all agree that patients deserve better than that, the current state of play. So I've talked about the burden. But within your services at this moment in time, on average, what is the proportion of your working week involved in managing leg ulcers? So this can be any aspect of leg ulcer care. This can be arranging the prescriptions. This could be um, allocating the visits. This could be actually seeing the patients. How, what is the percentage on average in your average week of how much time that you're spending dealing with these patients? So 
It doesn't really surprise me that between 25 and 50 percent of your working week on average for you guys is spent with Demon Legals. So some of you actually it looks like this is all you're doing day in day out. And we know that from the national papers that an average district nurse is spending around 69% of her time now dealing with patients with lower leg wounds. The paper that I described to you from Julian Guest and Kath and Peter Vowden though did a couple of amazing things. It really looked at the burden of the disease in terms of the overall NHS spend. And it came out that we're spending £5.3 billion each year dealing with patients with wounds and their comorbidities. And when you look at that, it's up there within the top five spends of the overall NHS. And these type of statistics really get the ear of the payers, the commissioners and of Whitehall in terms of the policy makers. But for me, remember I'm a vascular nurse. This paper did one great thing. It articulated how much of these wounds are actually on the lower leg. Because I've had multiple arguments over my career with my tissue viability colleagues and my nursing director colleagues to say why is all the focus, all the investment, all of the money going there at that 7% of pressure ulcers. And actually if you look at the burden for lower leg wounds, it's around a third of all of these wounds. And so, thankfully, over the last few years, we've been able to be able to turn to face the elephant in the room. And actually, leg ulcers are getting more up there in terms of national recognition. But the problem is the state of reality at this moment in time is far from what it could be. At this moment, we're only healing 47% of venous leg ulcers within 12 months. 47%. I can show you a number of research papers where we've got standard control groups where you can get healing at around 86% after 16 weeks. So how can research show us we can heal simple venous leg ulcers within a timely fashion? But the reality of day to day is that we're only healing 47% of those patients within that 12 month period. And there's a huge issue with that in terms of if you are only healing half of your caseload this year, next year you've got your whole new caseload and your half a year legacy. The year after, you've got your new caseload, your half a year legacy, your half a year legacy. How many years until your service has become completely and utterly unsustainable? And sometimes it feels that we're on that cliff edge right now. So why are things so bad? Well, there's a number of reasons why things are so bad. And I think actually, you and me are to blame for some of this. Because what have we done to the word ulceration? Somehow our patients are scared to death of that word. How many patients have said to you, it's not a leg ulcer, is it? Why do they think like that? Having an accurate diagnosis should be something that they're craving, not something that they go, it's not a leg ulcer, is it? So if there's that fear in the patient, of course there's going to be a degree of, of, of delay in reporting that problem. There's another word problem with the word ulceration. To get on the leg ulcer pathway, somebody's got to recognise that it's an ulcer. So you could have a skin tear on your leg that's been present for eight weeks. You could have a his surgical wound on a leg with edema and it's a, it's a surgical site infection. Nobody makes that recognition of do all wounds on a lower leg require an assessment and appropriate compression. Following that, there's a whole host of problems in terms of the ABPI. The reasons why it's not been performed. I haven't got a Doppler, I haven't got time, I haven't got the competences. And my favourite one is the patient answered the door. So what happens is that the patient is told to go and lay down in your back bedroom, lay down for half an hour because you've got to be perfectly rested before I come to do this API. Leave the door on the latch, I'll let myself in. If the patient actually answers the door, oh, we've got to cancel your ABPI now because you haven't been rested for 30 minutes. Now, up in Yorkshire, where I'm from, we can leave the door on the latch without a problem. But imagine that happening in central London. You'd have a whole new family living by the time that you've had your 30 minutes rest downstairs. But we shouldn't be withholding this. This is a part of a diagnostic toolkit. If you suspected a patient had an anemia, you would arrange for them to have a blood test. You wouldn't allow a delay of three, four, five weeks to be able to get that appropriate test. Even if we've got that, there's a problem with the interpretation of the ABPI. The ABPI is 0.81, so I've put that patient in reduced compression. 
No, it doesn't matter where you sit between 0.8 and 1.3. That is all perfectly normal. Therefore, that patient is suitable for full strength therapeutic compression. And even if we've got all of that, there's a problem with nurses making the diagnosis. For some reason, you don't feel comfortable or confident to be able to say that is a venous leg ulcer. If I said to you, um, I went to the toilet this morning, um, I had really pain when I, when, I, when I weed, it really burnt, and I've got a really strong fishy odour coming from my urine. What's wrong with me? UTI. You haven't examined me, you haven't dipsticked me urine, you haven't even looked at me in any way and you've all diagnosed me with a UTI. So somehow you've got confidence in diagnosis in some spheres, but in terms of labelling patients with a diagnosis of venous leg ulcers, you seem to be a little bit lacking of confidence. Can I say to you that as a nursing fraternity and a podiatrist, you have more experience than this than your medical colleagues will ever have. Have the courage of your conviction. Labelling a patient with a venous leg ulcer or an arterial leg ulcer or a mixed disease leg ulcer is vital because those diagnoses are linked with an evidence-based treatment pathway. And if it's a venous leg ulcer, you, need to, you know you need to face east in terms of re, uh, compression therapy. If it's an arterial wound, you know you need to face the other direction in terms of revascularization. But even if we've got all of that, we've got a problem with the underuse of compression, subtherapeutic compression, anything less than 40 milligrams of mercury pressure is wasting your time. Wasting your time. You need at least 40 milligrams of mercury pressure on. And please don't tell me it's because your patients can't tolerate it, because I think it's simply the way that you're selling it to them. And even if we've got all of that right, we've still got problems with this. Now, that nurse didn't do that intentionally. She did that because she hasn't had the appropriate training or education. I'd hate to ask all this audience here today how many of you are here in your own time. Somehow, the requirement for a nurse's CPD has been lost. And we need to be standing up as a professional body to say we should be having paid CPD, just like the medics do, within a timely sphere. That is moving at this moment in time. The RCN are doing a bit of a campaign towards that, so hopefully. So when you think of all of that, you can see why we're in such a problem. You can see why we're only getting healing rates at 47% after a year. Because we've got poor assessments poor diagnosis. We've got the underuse of evidence-based therapies such as the ABPI for assessment, such as compression therapy, such as venous ablation. And we've got overuse of ineffective therapies like compression, reduced compression, modified compression. They aren't clinically effective. And we have a huge problem in the variation of commissioning. It always makes me sort of chuckle that we are a national health service but there isn't two localities that serviced exactly the same. There is no national commissioning. Some of you may have access to leg ulcer clinics, some of you may not. Some of you may have a lymphedema service, some of you may not. So as to say that we're a national health service always makes me chuckle slightly. But we all recognise that the NHS hasn't got an infinity amount of money or an infinity amount of professionals or clinicians. So if we're ever going to meet the targets of raising population numbers and complexity, we need to start to think about things differently. NHS England, along with NHS Improvement, have been looking at leg ulcer care, and many of you will have heard of the Betty story. If you haven't, just Google Betty story leg ulcer. It's a fantastic little cartoon video that you can look at. Within that story, it basically talks of a woman that basically has edema on her lower leg, goes to the GP with some edema, and the, the GP goes, oh well, they're there. She goes back with some further edema, and he goes, mm, might try you with some diuretics, might not. Then she goes out, she knocks a leg, she comes back to the GP, the GP refers her to the practice nurse, practice nurse puts a little band-aid on it, and carries on. And because it's treated as a traumatic wound, nobody understands the requirement for compression until that later stage of six, eight, 12 weeks. And when they looked at the cost associated with that, they showed that the cost associated with suboptimal care is actually 10 times more costly than getting it right first time. If I talk to you about cost improvement programs, if any of you have been in the profession for long enough, cost improvement programs feels as a nurse to me, you're gonna take a bed off my unit, you're going to take some staff away from me, or you're going to downgrade some of my staff, because that's how cost improvement feels. 
But actually, this is cost improvement that we can all get on board with, because this is cost improvement that truly does reduce costs, but it improves patient outcomes at the same time. And these are the type of cost improvements that we should be looking at. I'm also leading the lower limb stream for the National Wound Care Strategy. You may have heard of that. There is a national strategy that's going to be coming out by the end of this year about how we're going to treat all wounds. It's based on these three streams, but it's backed on four enablers. So we're looking at the research, what is the education and the numbers of workforce required to deliver a new way of working? What data and information do we need? And what, um, in terms of supply and demand, do we need? So the landscape is changing. Because if we've got to save this amount of money, we have to be starting thinking things differently. And that's why I'm here today with you. Because I ask, is it time to challenge your own practice? Are you doing the best you possibly can in the sphere of leg ulcers? So when we talk about best practice, we're talking about evidence base. We're talking about outcomes that will improve your outcomes for your patient. And what I'd like to remind you all of is to remember that when you're dealing with a leg ulcer, you need to think of it as a weed. You wouldn't go into your garden and chop your dandelion head off on a weekly basis. You have to actually tackle the roots. And with a venous leg ulcer, you have to think of it as the same. All you're seeing on the top of the surface is the weed. But actually, the problem is within the roots. It's within the superficial venous system often. And we need to target that superficial venous system because that's what's feeding this leg ulcer. And the way that we do that is compression therapy and at times venous ablation. In other words, getting rid of that superficial venous incompetence. So rather than focusing on what dressing are we putting on, you need to be focusing on how much compression are you putting on? Because dealing with the wound bed in isolation will never get you anywhere. Because what we need is a favourable wound bed, but at the same time appropriate compression to be able to get that wound to heal. So when you think about patients going into compression therapy, you may think instantly of traditional fall air compression bandaging. But things have changed greatly. And maybe it's time to think about how your patients now can self-care for their leg ulcer. There was a trial called Venus 4 that was done back in 2014 that was a head-to-head -head co control trial, looking at four-layer compression bandaging and the two-layer compression hosiery kits. These are the two-layer compression hosiery kits. This study was multiple manufacturers. It's not just one specific brand. But any compression hosiery kit that is designed to provide 40 milligrams of mercury pressure within two garments is as good as fall air compression bandaging. It heals the same. It's slightly cheaper. But look what it does to your prevention of your recurrence. Less people recur when healed with a hosiery kit compared to when healed with a compression bandaging. And that makes sense, really, because if I treat you as a patient, if I treat you with a compression bandage, I give you some, I heal you with your compression bandage, you go away, I give you a pair of class two stockings to wear forever. How many of your patients have come back to you and say, I'll see you in six weeks, they come back and you go, oh, where's your stocking? I haven't put it on today to save you a job. They all say it to you. They bring it out in its packaging and they say, I wear it every day, every day never been opened. <laughs> it's because they see no relationship between the requirement for ongoing compression. If you had a leg ulcer and you wore a compression hosiery kit at some point during your wounding and you saw and your clinician talked to you about what this is doing in terms of reducing the venous pressure and you saw your wound getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, the chances of them having some brain connection between the requirement for ongoing compression is much stronger. Therefore, you get a better compliance with the ongoing requirement for compression. And that's why within the leg ulcer algorithm that's on your chairs, we step every patient down to a hosiery kit at some point prior to their wounding, uh, prior to their healing. So this was all published back in 2014. But the problem was, we knew about this from a research and an academic point of view, but none of this was being translated into clinical practice. And that's when me and Joy Tickle, who's coming next, had our bit of a light bulb moment. You guys don't read The Lancet. 
You, you've got too many, you've got a life. You're not like me. So what you guys needed was for somebody to translate the evidence base into an easy to follow algorithm. And that's what we've been able to produce for you. If you follow this algorithm, you will get evidence-based care for your patients with your leg ulcers. You can tailor the product that's mentioned on that to whatever's on your local formulary. Because there's evidence for compression hosiery kits, but it doesn't matter which manufacturer you use. There's evidence for elasticated bandages, but it doesn't matter which manufacturer you use. And there's evidence to say that short stretch bandaging is better for edema management than elastic bandaging. But again, it's not product specific. So you can simply use that algorithm and plug in your own products in the right boxes. But that, what that will ensure is that you are getting it right for each of your patients at every single time. And what this does, it really puts that evidence into practice. It helps you to think about compression hosiery kits first line, if ever you can. Because if you have a wound that is controlled, the extra date's controlled within the dressing, and there isn't significant amount of edema, your patient should go into a hosiery kit first time. It uses this step-down approach to get patients into hosiery kit prior to healing to get that degree of brain training. It sees that patient's connection of this is their disease. This is chronic venous insufficiency. <coughs> this is the patient's responsibility to manage on their lifelong basis. Somehow, with venous leg ulcers, it seems to be our problem as the clinician. What other chronic disease do you know that you handhold your patient on a regular basis with? We just need to start to think about things very differently. So at this moment in time, if you use your voting pads, how confident do you currently feel in the management of your patients with venous leg ulcers? Do you feel very confident that you know what you're doing? Do you feel fairly confident? Or do you feel a little bit uncertain at times? Or do you feel like you're a complete novice in this area and you've got very little confidence? If you'd like to vote, and isn't that interesting that predominantly you told me you are an adult community nursing workforce and you told me a large proportion of your time is dealt with patients with venous leg ulcers, but many of you are feeling <coughs> slightly uncomfortable in managing these patients. And I know why, because you are generalists in so many things and you're supposed to know so much. I may look very clever studier, but all I know is leg ulcers. I don't know anything about long-term condition management. I don't know anything about immunisation or asthma or any or palliative care. So for you guys to get very confident in this stream is really difficult because of your broadity. But that's what this is enables you to do. If you put this on your wall and just follow the algorithm, you will ensure that you are getting it right. LNR has split it up into three different things to help you with your wound management too. They talk about debridement. They have exudate solutions for you to be able to manage your exudate. And my colleague Joy Tickle is going to be going into the exudate management side of this in a little while. But it talks about self-care solutions to try to get your patients to self-care wherever possible. And also it really brings in the importance of prevention of recurrence of wounds. And that's it. It's a simple algorithm. When I talk about self-care solutions, what does that really mean? Well, it means these. Getting your patients into these first time as soon as you possibly can. Because if you get a patient into a leg ulcer hosiery kit, the compression value is within the garment. So it doesn't matter who puts it on. If that patient requires ongoing wound care, you could have a, a, a non-registered member of staff doing it. You could ask the patient to self-care. You could ask the family to get involved. There are other systems available too, such as the compression wrap systems, but the evidence for these isn't as clear as it is with the compression hosiery kit. We've got head-to-head -head trials to say that these are as good as. With the, at this moment in time, we're just about to start a trial, a head-to-head -head randomised control trial, to see if the leg wraps are um, as good as, but they've certainly got a place. So when I ask you about who can self-care, which one of your patients would you talk about self-caring? Some of you may be dabbling in self-care right now, so some of you may be treating patients with venous leg ulcers and you've already got them into hosiery kits. And practice nurses are devils for this. The wound dressing needs changing twice a week. So come to see me on a Tuesday, but on a Friday I finish at one o'clock. So can you change your own dressing on a Friday and then see me the following week? Are some of you dabbling in that type of method? I think we need to go further. 
If a patient is able to do their own wound care, as any nurse, what we should be doing is saying, here's your compression hosiery, here's how to look after your wound. Here are your dressings, here is your information and your red flags. Change the wound twi dressing twice a week, I will see you again in six weeks. Why not? What is the risk of doing that? There is an element of, could that patient be non-concordant? Potentially. But coming to see you on a weekly basis, are you going to really change? Yeah, they like your company. Is that the job of the nurse within the NHS? No, it's not. And we need to be challenging this. And if I ask you who can self-care, you may be thinking of the young, fit, independent, say, us getting a leg ulcer. Don't think of self-care as a bad thing. If you had a leg ulcer, would you really want to go to see your practice nurse twice a week? I certainly wouldn't. I would prefer to self-care. I have a busy life. I don't want to be tagged by that. Remember, your patient population is changing. It's not going to be those little old ladies who's a little bit bored. It's our generation. We are the future of the patients. We're going to want different things. But you may think it's the young and the fit, but I think that you need to think about changing your views. Maybe it's not. Maybe we need to think about any patient being able to self-care because many of these patients are going to have this long-term condition for the rest of their lives. I'd like you to meet Sheila. This is her real name and this is her real face, obviously, and she's a patient of mine. She gave her permission to be photographed and for her to be shared with you today. She's had spina bifida from a child and she's been in a wheelchair all her life. She started to develop lower leg edema and then she started to have lymphorrhea of her lower leg. Because she's non-housebound, she couldn't get a district nurse to visit her. So the solution was she had to go to her practice nurse. And her options were a 20-minute self-propel push down to the practice nurse and then a 20-minute self-propel push up the hill back home again. You can't do that, Sheila? Right, we'll get your hospital transport then to get you. So hospital transport is two full days out of your life, isn't it? If you're coming on hospital transport, wipe the day out of your diary. Sheila came to me in floods of tears. She said, I've been in a wheelchair all my life, I self catheterise. I have looked after myself all my life, and now all of a sudden, you are telling me I have to be reliant on this nurse. And she says, am I going to need this forever? I went, yeah, you're going to need it forever. She went, well, I demand a self-care solution. We put her in a compression wrap system. She managed to heal her leg ulcer, and now she manages her leg long-term herself. Isn't that better for her? Of course. Isn't that better for us and our services? Absolutely. And when you think of Sheila, don't think it's her husband that's helping her out. Her husband did not give his permission to be photographed, as you can see, but Sheila told him to sit there. <laughs> he too has spina bifida and he's in a wheelchair too. These two are like Dick and Liddy. They're absolutely fantastic. So fiercely independent. So why shouldn't we enable these patients to self-care? That should be his first line approach. These patients are going to require lifelong management they need to take some responsibility. It's the same as the patient with the wet, leaky legs that won't go to bed, that won't wear compression bandaging. Can somebody explain to me why that is my problem as a nurse? Because that patient is taking no responsibility for their own health. We need to change that dichotomy around to be able to empower those patients better. You may say that your patients won't self-care, but I think it's the way that you're selling it to them. I think if you've got anybody on your books currently and you start to say to them, I'm not going to see you, you're going to be on your own for six weeks, they'll be writing to CCG and their MP. But it's about your next patient. The next patient that you see and you say to them, have you got the ability to self-care? Yes, you have. Right, here's your tools, here's your information, here's your red flags, here's my contact number if you need to see you, I'll see you in six weeks. That patient will go, oh, don't I see you for wound care? And your answer is, no, we've changed. And I can tell you they accept it so quickly because it's not a bad thing. We see self-care as a detriment, but it's not. It's actually an empowerment of a patient, which is a good thing. So we've got this method now being adopted across a number of CCGs and we've got demonstrable outcomes and we really are changing lives. And the impact of this is massive. Because we're getting it right first time, because we're getting patients into appropriate compression, we're able to reduce healing time significantly. 
We were able to reduce for simple wounding from 96 days down to 59 days, but for the most complex of wounds from 165 days down to 57 days. Because remember, the most complex of leg that you're seeing today started off as a tiny wound at some point in time. And there is a window of opportunity within those first few weeks of wounding to get this right. What this does, it releases a hell of a lot of money. But for me, it was not never about the money. When I first heard that Julian Guest paper that told me only 16% of patients had an ABPI, I sat in an audience like this with my arms folded. I whispered to my colleague and said, not where we are, we're much better than that. Because I didn't believe that figure. I thought we were better than that. So what I did straight from that conference, I went out and I did a little snapshot audit of one of my district nurse locations. Within that, we found that there were 34 patients with a leg ulcer. This were equating to 74 visits a week. So most patients were having two visits every week. And when we looked at patients that were showing signs of healing, only two out of the 34 patients were showing signs of healing. When we looked, yeah, we had more ABPIs being done. We had 34% of ABPIs being done, but only 13% of that caseload were in full strength therapeutic compression. Only 13%. All we did, we got this pathway implemented. We got everybody to live and breathe it. Right the way from HCA, TAs, all the way through to, to the district nurse team leaders, to every practice nurse in that location too. So we're all singing from the same song sheet. Within three months, we'd made significant progress. Now 56% of those patients were showing signs to healing. In fact, in that time, we were able to heal a third of those patients. But more importantly for me, we were able to reduce the number of, of district nurse input by 43%. We reduced it down from 74 down to 42%. Now, you in your service, wherever you are at this moment in time, I can imagine each day you come on time, you have your scheduled uninterrupted breaks, you go for an hour's lunch every day, and you finish on time every day. The reality is completely different to that, isn't it? The unfortunate thing is you are all coming to work half an hour earlier to get a half stead on. You're eating a sandwich while you're on a phone while you're doing your system one. You're going home late from work on a regular basis. And many of you are telling me now that you are doing your system one entry at home on a night time while cooking the tea, feeding the baby and saying to your husband, had a nice day. We need to stop some of this. Nursing at this moment in time is not the nicest place to be because unfortunately it is starting to impact on our lives in terms of you're having arguments with your husband about being home late from work again. And all of this needs to stop. Many of you will have thought in your darkest of hours, what am I doing being a nurse? Tesco's pay more than a band five nurse. Why aren't I in Tesco's? But I can tell you why you've come into this job. You've come into this job because you are genetically a Labrador. <laughs> you are, that's why you're here. You've still got a genetic tail. The only reason why you're here is that you want this. You want thank you. That's why you're here. Because when somebody thanks you for doing your intervention, your tail wags. Imagine a world where you are reducing your input for, for patients with venous leg ulcer by 43%. What could you do with that extra time? Could you actually talk to your patients and actively listen? Could you actually start to finish on time? Could you actually start to feel empowered that you've come into the profession that you absolutely love? Because when you enable a patient to self-care and to heal, and when they say the words, thank you, you can walk out of that environment like a proud peacock, your tail wagging and say, I love my job and I love my profession. The impact of all of this is absolutely massive for our patients, but also for your well-being. So do me all a favour. Join the Legals for Revolution and release your time to care. Thank you.